In this video, I want to show you the foundation which functional programming is built on, and you will be amazed how simple but powerful it is. This will actually help us to visualize and remember jargons and tools that exist in functional programming. So although this video is abstract, bear with me on this, and you'll see concepts which weren't easy to learn in other books and courses become obvious and intuitive. Functional programming is designed from a branch of mathematics called category theory. Category theory can be seen as a parent to many branches of mathematics like set theory, type theory, and many others. What do we talk about in category theory? Well, we talk about categories. A category is simply a bunch of objects, which here I'm showing with dots, and arrows between them which are called morphs. Objects and arrows are primitive and don't have any internal structures in categories, other than arrows start from an object and end with an object. Let's see what we can do with bunch of objects and arrows. Between two objects, we can have one or many arrows. We can also have reverse arrows on those objects. We can have arrows from an object to itself, and we can also have many of them. But not every collection of points and arrows is called a category. They need to follow three rules, and all of them are about composing and combining arrows. More specifically, these rules are composition definition, composition associativity, and composition identity. First, Let's see what do we mean by composing arrows. Composition is defined over two arrows, which one follows from the end of the other. In a category, if we have two arrows like this, then we should also have a third arrow starting from the start of the first arrow and ends with the end of the second arrow. If we call our initial arrows F and G, then Ka is the composition of F and G, and we write it as ka is the composition of g after f. And that's our first rule. The second rule is about composition of three arrows which are following each other. Considering the first rule, we'll automatically have these arrows as well. Let's focus on the final arrow, which is the composition of f, g, and h. The associativity rule states that the order of composing F, G, and H is not important, meaning that if we compose F and G first and then compose H with the result, we would get the exact same arrow when composing G and H first and then composing F with the result of it. This is called associativity, and it is written like this. As you see, I'm not showing any parentheses in the final composed arrow, because it is not important. In general, in a category, we don't care about the order in which we do composition. This has a great benefit. It means we don't need to remember in which order we should compose our arrows, and it simplifies the way we can reason about the composition. Our last rule is the simplest of them all. Let's first label the objects in our example. Composition identity states each object should have an arrow to itself. Let's name these arrows ID. As you see, each object has their own ID arrow. Because this rule is called composition identity, then these arrows should have something to do with composition. Let's take a closer look at object 1 and 2. Here we have three arrows, ID1, ID2, and F. Think about how we can compose these arrows. What is the composition of F and ID1? It is an arrow starting from the start of ID1 and ends with the end of F, right? Which is exactly the F. We can say the same thing for the composition of ID2 and F, which is again F. And that is why we call this rule composition identity. If our points and arrows follows these three rules, then we have a category. And that's it. 
Pretty simple, right? But you may think, how come such a simple thing can lead to enterprise applications? Or maybe a better question is, how does this much abstraction benefit us? Well, to the first question, not only you can model your programming languages with this, but as a matter of fact, programming is just a small example of using categories. It turns out you can model many mathematical concepts and theories with categories. So whatever insight you could discover at this level of abstraction, then you will automatically have it for all the models following it. That is pretty neat, isn't it? And as you will see, we can learn a lot about our models at the level of categories. The trick is to model your problem in objects and arrows, see if all the category rules are valid for it, and you got yourself a category. And along with it comes all the goodies. Functional programming is one of those models. So guess what? If not all, a lot of jargons and tools in functional programming are coming from concepts and patterns in categories. So if you understand basics of category theory and patterns in it, then you already know a lot about functional programming. Let's take a look at an example. Let's think about order in general. We can think of objects as anything that can be compared and arrows between them modeling if an object comes before or after the other. Then is order a category? Let's check category rules one by one. The first one is the composition definition. Think of another arrow starting from the object B and ends with the object C. Can we say object A is less than or equal to C? Meaning, can we have an arrow from A to C? Well, if A is less than B and B is less than C, then A is less than C. In order to check associativity, let's think of another arrow from object C to object D. Based on the composition definition, we also have arrows B to D and A to D. Let's label the arrows and think about the final composition arrow. Does it make a difference to compare F and G first or compare H and G first? It doesn't, right? In any order we compare our objects, A will be smaller than D. Or in another words, we can write it like this. So far so good. Our last rule is identity arrow. Does each object smaller than or equal to itself? Based on our definition of order, it is. But if we had defined our order as a strictly smaller, then this rule wasn't valid. As you see, all category rules are valid for the order. So order is a category. Let's look at another example. This time, let's start from a model. Let's think of our objects as sets and relation between them as if a set is a subset of another set, meaning that all the elements of a set exist in another one. Does this model lead us to a category? Well, we need to check the rules. First, can we compose is subset relations? Yes. As you see from our example here, set X is a subset of set X, Y, Z. So we can draw an arrow between them. Does chain of is subset relations associative? I leave this as an exercise to you, but if you try it yourself, you'll see it doesn't matter in which order we compose our arrows here. All of them lead to set X is a subset of set W, X, Y, Z. And finally, we already know every set is a subset of itself. So we have an identity arrow for each object. All the composition rules are valid. So it seems that we got ourselves a category here. But wait a second. I told you that objects are atomic in category and they don't have any internal structure. 
but here we are dealing with sets and we're looking at their members to draw a line between them. We're having a good thing going on here, so let's fix this. Let's get rid of all the details and keep only the arrows and points. We didn't touch the composition of arrows, so the rules are still valid. It's like we got an amnesia and forgot what all those objects were. We only see the compositions. And now we can say we have a category. So basically, category is nothing but compositions. It's all about compositions. And what we try to do is to encode everything, and I mean everything using composition. For our last example, let's look at something more practical. Let's think about types and functions which we use in our day-to-day -day life as programmers. We are again to start from a model and try to see if we can come up with a category. As you remember from earlier videos in this course, functions are simply a mapping of values between two types. Here, for example, we have a function that rounds a floating point values to integer values. So let's simplify our diagram here and have our round function with an arrow from float type to an integer type. By the way, this is not the only function between float and integer type. We can have many other mappings. So does this example of computational model lead to a category? If it does, then we have an abstraction that is backed by all the awesome work that mathematicians have done long before computers. Exciting, right? So let's give it a try. In order to see if our model here is fitting a category, let's check the category axioms. First is to check how our arrows can be composed. If we have another function from an integer to boolean called is even, then by what we learned so far, we can use function composition to combine these two functions into a function that receives floats and returns a boolean. So we have a general way to compose functions with matching types. As I mentioned previously, I like to think of functions as pipes. They receive a value and transforms them into another value. So in our analogy, function composition is like connecting two pipes together. Next, let's check and see if our function composition is associative. In order to do that, let's extend our example and add to a string function at the end of the chain. And we know by using the first rule, we can have all these functions and arrows as well. The function composed can be implemented like this. The question is, should we compose is even and to a string first, or we should compose round and is even first? Good news is, it doesn't matter. As long as our functions are pure, then both leads to the same result. Thinking about function composition associativity using our pipe analogy, it really doesn't matter if we compose the first pair of pipes first, or we compose the last pair first. All of them lead to the same result. And that's associativity rule. The last rule states that objects should have an identity morph. And we certainly have one. This function is simply returning exactly whatever it is receiving. With this definition, composing the incoming and outgoing functions with the ID returns those functions themselves. So all types can use function ID as their composition identity morph. And that is our computational model, which all the composition rules are valid for it. As I mentioned, in a category, objects and morphs are atomic. So let's get rid of details and look at these as simply points and arrows. And we got ourselves a category. So any discoveries, tricks and techniques mathematicians have found at this level of abstraction, we can use in our programming practices. And to be honest, there are tons of goodies out there. And that's why we love functional programming. All right. In the last, I want to mention a great course I found in YouTube on category theory from Bartosz Mileski. I'll add a link to this playlist in the description. 
And I want to thank my dear friend, Farid Hosseini, for helping me understanding the math side of these concepts. And finally, thank you for watching this video. Please like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next one.